Welcome to What CEOs Talk About. Do you wonder what CEOs talk about behind closed doors? How they bring their vision to reality? How do they overcome and succeed through adversity? We share that and so much more with each episode. Now, let's get started with the show. Hello, everybody. My name is Martin Hunter. I am the host of What CEOs Talk About. Today, we have Danielle on the show. Danielle, thank you very much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Martin. I'm excited to be here. Could you introduce yourself? Who are you? What's your name? What do you do for a living? Yeah, I love to. My name is Danielle Putnam. For a living today, I'm the president of the New Flat Rate and have been for the past 10 years. We were a startup in the garage and classic startup you know, story, feast of famine all the time, right? You blow all your credit cards or your savings accounts for this idea that may or may not work, but you believe in it so much. And all your friends and family are like, you're crazy. <laughs> uh, but we hung in there 10 years and now all of a sudden we've got an awesome company and we're all over the US and Canada and I couldn't be prouder. So that's become a lot of my identity, if we could be honest, right? So I, I am the president of the new flat rate. I'm also an advisor advisory board member, past president for women in HVACR, oh. and I have my own nonprofit called Family Frameworks, and I'm the executive director for that. And then I'm starting to dabble more in real estate. We have an LLC, then we're starting to do more real estate. <laughs> in. So, so I'm learning to be a serial entrepreneur. Oh, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it gets contagious, right? It gets contagious. Yeah. You start wanting to go, what else can I do? What else can I do? What else can I do? Oh. You know, if we could be so, so honest, Martin, though, I've become, I have three young children and I'm starting to become really selfish with my time now. Mm -hmm. Now that I have children and they are just the joy of my life, I'm learning the importance of saying no and really starting to pull back from things. And if it's, you know, weighing the value and, and the worth and because we're all as entrepreneurs looking for more freedom in our lives. And so for me right now, it's freedom to spend time with my children. It is, it always comes back to that. It is, it amazes me how often at times when you're past that stage of seeking income, I guess, yeah. you, you know, um, you know, a lot of people who are not entrepreneurs and, and it, it, one or the other is not, is not the end all be all or one's mm -hmm. not good and one's not bad, but really what we as entrepreneurs cherish of what the employees have is they can turn it off. They go, yeah. yeah, I got six weeks holidays. When I say out of office, I leave, I disconnect, I come back. It'll take totally. me a couple of days to get to there where we as entrepreneurs who are always thinking about what to do and how to mm -hmm. get it done, you get to a point where you're like, okay, I've worked my ass off to get here. Where's my time off? Right. All right. Yeah. So. Well, and then you feel guilty. There's oh. this guilt. I, I can't take time off because then my people are going to see that I'm gone. They think that I'm always gone and then the machine's not going to keep going and somebody's got to feed it. It's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, I, I should be a little bit more specific. It's not just entrepreneurs, it's CEOs, founders, the people who are usually at the head of an organization in general. And that kind of really leads well into the title that you pick today. I think that's going to be a sweet conversation. And what, Danielle, what is the title of the show today? Well, thanks for asking, Martin. And I did put some thought into this because it's something that I'm currently struggling with. The title is Enabling the Wrong Behaviors. So enabling our teams to have the wrong behaviors. And I often find myself getting stuck not delegating something because I think in my mind and tell myself, oh, that employee is busy. They don't have time for it, so I'll just do it. <laughs> or I won't I won't hold them accountable to reporting that back to me because they don't have time to go find that number. So I'll just not have the number or I'll go get it myself. And so what I've found, Martin, is we've gotten stuck on this plateau in my business and maybe in a lot of the, you know, the listeners and their businesses too, that we're on a certain plateau and to get to the next level, I have to allow my team to accept ownership and responsibility for their roles and their lanes so that to Together we can all grow to the next level and I it's consuming my thoughts uh, that that is amazing because I just went through so the the four cardinal rules of leadership that I tell people all the time is delegate facilitate elevate and celebrate 
Two little times we delegate. And when you delegate it, you have to do it diligently. And I think that that's a, a key component that the responsible versus rescue leader, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think it really resonates with parents. I think most sure of all, because you go, do I teach my kid how to, to make craft dinner for lunch? Cause that's the first thing my daughter <laughs> learned how to make Katie mac and cheese. Right. Do I, do I keep doing it for her? Or do right. I teach her how to do it, then hold her accountable of being safe and all that good stuff, all the yeah. behaviors that, that do that. Mm-hmm. But too many times, mm-hmm. our actions don't meet our intentions. We want to be good bosses and therefore we'll mm-hmm. do it for them, right? We do, we do. And then subconsciously, oh, we're just the best boss and they just love us because we keep their lives easy and cushioned. And we're doing everybody a disservice. We're not allowing them to grow. We're not allowing them to mature, right? And they're not being stretched. They're just in their little comfort zone. And that pulls into retention too. I really believe it does. If people aren't challenged and they get bored, then they're going to start looking elsewhere. And people want a career path to grow with your business. And so giving them more responsibility really ties that together with retention and growth. Um, You know, it's, it's easy to say, learn to delegate, learn to delegate, but delegating things that we know we can do faster is difficult, just like the mac and cheese. Oh, it, our uh, uh, our vision of velocity is critical, right? So you say, how fast do I need to get this done? How fast? And I think when you get to a point, and I think you're there in your business now, you're going, velocity, speed doesn't matter anymore. Quality mm-hmm. is more important. And that mindset shift as you as the leader, I think is critical to say, I got to, I got to, I got to step back a little bit, right? Yes. Yeah. That's a great way to say that. I haven't heard anybody talk about velocity like that in business. Oh, I mean, especially when you've put, I mean, we said it in the pre-show, you know, you put your house, you get a second mortgage, you do this, you do that. Speed matters. It Mm -hmm. does matter because you need to keep the momentum because if you don't keep momentum, like riding a motorcycle, you'll tip over. So mm-hmm. if you keep some certain speed, then you're keeping on your path, right? So I think that uh, too many people forget how to do that. So tell us, tell us, Danielle, tell us your story. How did how did all of this start? Because you said the garage. And so I'm, I'm a dude, so I like to spend time in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so how did your story start? Garages look very different. Today, my husband and I, we have this uh, garage, and he just took one of his bays and turned it into his man cave. And so he's got a nice big 110-inch screen and projector, and he's watching the games out there, and it's all freshly painted, and he's got just everything's beautiful and matches. It's all navy and gray, and it's Braves colors, right? I'm in Georgia. We are Atlanta Braves people. And so, you know, it's such a beautiful garage, and I'm like, oh, I could build a business in here. This is a great space. And now erase that thought because that is not the garage we started in. (laughs) Instead, we started in my dad's garage because my dad was a contractor. And as a contractor, heating and air, electrical and plumbing, Mm -hmm. he had issues and problems in his business and out of pain trying to solve his problems, developed the concept of the new flat rate, which is a menu pricing system. And so because my dad and I were best friends, we were always talking about this system and how it was working to help his business and save his business. So I I used to be in the tech world out in California. And because we were having these conversations, I quit and moved back to Georgia. And in my dad's garage is where we started new flat rate. And that garage was a big open bay with boats and four wheelers and, you know, piles of junk everywhere. Like nobody had a desk. Our first employee had a little $49 mobile desk from Walmart. And every day it was in a different spot. And she's like, could you please quit moving my desk? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is, oh my goodness. That is in the, in the things that you don't hear that often in say, okay, yeah. what are the things that, the silliest things that you've heard in your, uh, one yeah. employee can like, can you stop moving my desk? Oh my goodness, yeah. that's, that's hilarious. You know, every day, poor girl, she just wanted a space. Like, just let me know I have my own space. But then my dad's like, oh no, I was working on the boat last night and you were in the way. <laughs> How did you, how did you create, how did you and your dad create this wonderful relationship? Oh, you know, holly bum, are we so lucky? Like not everybody has that. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, 
we're so lucky. There's a lot of mutual respect. Now, one thing being family members, I grew up working in the family business as oh. a contractor. You know, he was a contractor. So I worked in the office answering phones, running parts out to the field as a high schooler. I was constantly around the business. But then I left and I went and I was gone for 11 years. And when I came back, I had already experienced and been trained, you know, work environment mm -hmm. and how to be a good employee. And I'd learned so much elsewhere, too, so that I was able to come back in the work world a little bit more as a peer instead of just as the the daughter who's trying mm -hmm. to help dad. So that was a different kind of professional respect that was really good in the beginning of our relationship as we'd worked separately for a long time. But just family-wise, when we were broke and young, uh, you know, my dad invested in a boat, in an old clunker boat. It was nothing nice at all. It was a, a blue mm. – do they call the front like a pickle nose? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was – you know, had an open bow but no, no leather seats or anything mm -hmm. and decided that he wanted activity for the family to do together. There was nine kids in our family. Oh, and so Moses. Right. There was a lot. And it's, you know, you can't buy things for everybody. And, mm -hmm. you know, we couldn't all go to different sports. You can't go to everybody's sporting events. And so he thought, you know, boating, we could all do it together. And then when one person is skiing, everybody else is in the boat looking at that person and cheering that person on. Mm -hmm. And so he just decided early on the importance of having family activities mm -hmm. to have the whole family together. And we, I don't know, I, I, you know, he was ultimately a great dad and, and we just, we got really lucky. Nobody could escape either. Like you're on yeah, the board. Right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> you're, yeah. You're I stuck mean, you with know? me and mom for the next four hours. Yeah. <laughs> and if you get in trouble, you know, he probably would throw you out of the boat, but it's a long swim back. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about what you had mentioned in regards to starting your business and stuff like that, I think a lot of people, well, first of all, you went, what you learned as a teenager is still living inside of you. It, and, and that's my opinion of what the school system, the school system really pumps out good employees. Mm -hmm. it, it does not pump out good entrepreneurs or people who can mm. think or problem solve what the true world is. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I think that, <clears throat> I think that you have seen over and you said, I say no more often than I say yes now, is you have a bigger list of what not to do Mm -hmm. than things of to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that took time, right? I'm, I'm really thankful. And I've read, gosh, I wish I could tell you exactly what book it was, but they definitely said um, the majority of billionaires, right, are where they are because of what they say no to, not because mm -hmm. of what they say yes mm -hmm. to. Like they Agreed. say no to everything Agreed. and yes to very few things. And so after I heard that, I, you know, and then also thinking about the work-life balance, I, I was just, I, you know, I, I need more freedom with my kids. And so I, I began to say no. The, actually there's one, uh, Richard Branson, Sir Richard Branson is the one that said, he always says yes to everything, figure out yeah. how after. Um, I think that the no is something that you learn to, from yes to no, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is, is, is an evolution. And I think that yeah. taking, a billionaire's advice when you have $30,000 in your bank account and looking to do your business as best you can, you say yes and figure it out after. Say yes, figure it out after. I think there's an evolution. And I there think is. that it comes into the title that you brought up. At first, you say, yes, I'll do it for you. Yes, I'll do it for you. You've got momentum. Now mm -hmm. you've reached a point where you're going, hmm, no is more powerful than yes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, boy, I love how you say that, Martin. The evolution is so true because in the beginning, <clears throat> what good perspective, my mantra was say yes to opportunity because we had to to grow, right? Mm -hmm. We had to to get noticed. And so, hey, will you write an article? Yes. Will you do this? Yes. Like always, yes, 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 yes. And then figure out how to do it. Will you go here? Yes. It was always yes. And that's why I joined boards and did different things. Mm -hmm. But because of that, it was a big part of getting to where we are here today, right? So you're so right on with the evolution of it. I had to say yes to opportunity to get the ball rolling. But then once it gets bigger, saying no to things and being very specific so that we can move to the next level. And if so you want to segue back first, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, 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 please go ahead, go ahead. 
Well, back to the the enabling the the wrong behaviors in the employees is that also was an evolution, just like mm-hmm. you say, you know, is there for a long time. It's OK. I have some employees and I got to keep them happy. And then the whole world's all scared about keeping their employees happy and comfortable. And over, especially over the last two, three years, mm-hmm. like what we're all finding in the job market is people straight out of college are making more money than you know, so you many are, people, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they can ask for it and they're getting it. And there's so much, you know, I've had interviews where these, uh, you know, I don't know which generation, millennial, Gen X, I don't know. It doesn't yeah. matter to me, but these, you know, interviewee candidates would be in there. They'd be like, okay, well, if I'm going to start for you, I'd like to start at 10 AM and then I'm going to do this. And, then, and I'm just like, are you joking? You know, there's spoofs and there's videos on YouTube about stuff like that. And it's really happened. I've had people like that sit in an interview and I'm just like, how did we get to this place? And so then we start managing with, you know, kit gloves, like coddling everybody. And so finally the evolution of, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to enable that behavior. This is my company. If you don't want to be here, get out. Right. (laughs) We had a conversation two years ago, a a rock star of a young person came up and, uh, So it it goes through uh, the interview cycle and it comes to me as managing partner and he says, well, I I want my path to partnership to be accelerated. (laughs) And I'm kind of like, uh, okay, tell me more. Like maybe, maybe there's, you're expressing yourself in a way that I'm not understanding. I, I want my path to partnership to be accelerated. Okay. So tell me more. What do you mean by that? Well, I think I should be a, a partner within the next 90 days. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm like, well, I've been to Harvard. Uh, ask me if I give a shit. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> totally. And, and so I was like, so I said, thank you very much. You're, you're, you know, you're not for us. And he's like, what? I was like, this interview lasted maybe what, 15 minutes. And he's like, what do you mean? No, I said, you're, you're not for us. But all the other partners said, you know, that they'd love to work with me and stuff. I said, yeah, but your attitude sucks. You think that you've got the sense of entitlement. I grew up on the East Coast of of Canada. So I grew up pretty poor. I would always, I just tell my friends and make fun. I said, I grew up poor, like P-O-O, because I couldn't afford the R at the end of poor. (laughs) We were six. I was a baby of six. I I never had a pair of Adidas or, you know, I always had hand-me-downs. Hand-me-downs, yep. And so, <laughs> so me with this kid, the sense of entitlement just infuriated me. And even if the, the right decision was to get the candidate that has lots of skills and experience, I think, no, no, no. I always hire for ask, attitude, skill, knowledge, and experience. Mm-hmm. And he, although he had the skill, the attitude outweighed the, his skill. So I said, and then he emailed us back. I'm terribly sorry. It didn't come across. Uh, you know, I was having that conversation with my dad and my dad said that was an idiot. And I was like, too late now, man. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> um, totally. Yeah. I'm writing that down. As you said, that ask attitude, skill, knowledge, and that's ask with an E because there's Correct. experience at the end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Too many people hire the wrong way, right? They'll say, what's your yeah. experience? What's your knowledge? What's your skill? And what's your attitude? And nine times out of 10, the attitude is what kills the job at the end. Mm -hmm. You've got somebody who's got a great skill, great knowledge, but they just bring everybody down. They bring the company down. I mean, we call it cancer, right? Cancer in the company. Exactly. Right. So if you go the opposite where you go, let me hire a young entrepreneurial mindset individual who's not afraid to work hard Mm -hmm. to start off. Who says yes to everything, right? Totally. Yeah, because they got to make it. Yeah. Right? They've got the skills. They've got problem-solving abilities, but they don't necessarily know, I'll take the HVAC business, right? Mm-hmm. They don't necessarily know. That you can teach. Mm-hmm. That you can teach. And experience will come through game game time. So yeah. you can't get game time if you're not on the pitch. If you're not on right. the field, you can't, you don't got yeah. game time. So. Yeah. So that's how we hire consistently. And that's what we tell our, our clients as well. Always, mm-hmm. but this this guy or this girl has got like 20 years of experience. Yeah, but they've only got like 122 contacts on LinkedIn. Right. 
do they have friends? Like, do they like people? <laughs> do, do people like them? Like, that's, you yeah. know, kind of, kind of the question. Um, so let me ask you a question here. So what is, so your, your new year's resolution is to say more, no more often, mm-hmm. no to what? No to distractions that are keeping my attention away from our company's goals and where we really want to go, right? So here at the new year, we're like, hey, write out your goals and what you want to do and let's plan out the quarters and here we have it and here's the roadmap of where we're going to be. But then all of a sudden, oh, curveball, curveball, this looks like fun, right? And it comes in things that look good. So for example, (laughs) uh, my PR company is like, hey, Danielle, you know, I got these five opportunities for you to do articles. That sounds really great because those are opportunities and that's media, right? And it's content. And so it sounds so good. But if I look at my goals here in my planner and like, wait a minute, do I have room to actually take the time to produce great content on those five articles about left field things that I'm not focused on right now? It would take away, you know, a lot of hours from moving my initiatives forward. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm like, nope. So I said, no, I'm sorry. I, I can't do that right now. Ask me again in six months. But right now, <laughs> if it's not moving this partnership forward, uh, I just had a new integration with a company called House Call Pro. And it's so exciting for our mutual customers. And it's a big API integration. And so that's a big deal. I love to podcast about it and talk about it because it's helping so many people. Mm-hmm. And to me, the world needs to know about it, right? So would I write an article about that right now? Yeah, absolutely, because it's helping all of my mutual customers and helping to move the initiatives mm-hmm. of the company forward. But other things, you know, will you write on XYZ? No, nope, not right now. Okay, cool. Now you had mentioned also your kids. Mm-hmm. So what? So what decisions? What's your decision process to? between work and family like what's what's something at work that would outweigh not out necessarily outweigh take care of your kids but say okay i've got i don't know what your family situation is or network when would you ask somebody to help take care of your kids that would take priority now they're not unsafe they're not nothing but what kind of emergency would push you to step away from your family Mm. safety is the number one thing right and you kind of hit on that a little bit so if my children are safe and secure and i know that they're fine Mm -hmm. and they've had mommy time over the weekend then i'll push 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 my company i know my kids are gonna be okay Mm -hmm. right so it's a little bit easier because i feel like in my off time I really focus on filling up their love tanks, like on the weekends <laughs> and on the evenings, I'm 1000% mom until they're in bed, right? Like I want a nanny so bad, but at the same time, I want my kids raised by their mom. So they're raised by their mom. You know, I, I want somebody else cooking dinner, but nope, I'm going to give you your fried chicken nuggets <laughs> that I just <laughs> took out of the microwave. <laughs> Let's just be honest, right? <laughs> because I, I want to be a part of that life. Otherwise, why did I have kids? But if there was something that I actually had to sacrifice good family time for, for my company, it would have to have a long payoff that was going to benefit my family in the future, right? Yeah. Like, hey, we're going to get to this financial marker in the business, and that's going to afford me to be able to take my family on this incredible vacation that they would love. Mm-hmm. Like, I have to have the reward has to include my family at the end. That's how I do it. I look at it. All right, in six months, my family's going to get this because of it. My my spouse, Tracy, my wife, she – I've traveled a lot, right? And we – she's um, – she's in the legal world and she paused her career when we decided to have children she's we we analyzed and we said okay you're you make a lot more money than i do i want to raise my children and therefore I, this is the choice that i've made right and it, i kind of got i don't want to say jealous but i was like okay am i spending enough time you know am right. i doing this and quality over quantity and she told me and that and I did a little bit of digging and something came up that said spend twice as much time as you would money on your children and you'll have good kids wow right yeah. and it's uh-huh. true yep. it's true right it is it don't is. remember the nuggets like I yeah <laughs> I remember mac and cheese and fried bologna I mean, that, yeah <laughs> totally and, uh, yeah 
Nowadays this... they've got you know the chicken nuggets shaped like the dinosaurs. <laughs> Let's add that dinosaurs. extra. <laughs> <laughs> There's too many times that you know you look at how. Let's let's bring it back to your dad, right? You you had to work when you were a teenager, mm -hmm. and look really? at look at the person that you are now. There's a one of I our, thank them for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Um, yeah. Too many kids come out and oh well, nowadays. Oh, well, I gotta ask my mom. I don't know what to do. Yeah. I gotta ask my mom. Yeah, a, a little bit yeah. of risk is okay. Yeah, I'll never forget when I was twelve. I wanted to go to the mall and buy my own clothes. So my mom taught me how to sew when I was a kid. And so I, and we were homeschooled. So of course I sewed all the, the nice jumpers, right. That are so not cool. Like I, I can't even describe to you. They're all blue jean jumpers yeah. and we'd have like fringe edges and stuff. And you know, I, I had all these uncool clothes, but I made them, but it's kind of like putting on a, a potato sack. Right. And so when I turned 12, I kind of wanted my own clothes and my yeah. mom's like, you can get whatever you want. You just got to go buy it yourself. I was like, okay, so who do you think got a job at 12 years old? I cleaned for Mrs. Richardson down the street every Saturday morning. So every Saturday morning, my friends are watching cartoons or doing whatever, and I was cleaning for Miss Richardson, $5 an hour for four hours. I got $20 a week. So with that $20 a week, I'd go to the mall, I'd buy my own clothes, because you could, you know, you could buy something for $20 a week back then. And then every night, once I got a little older, I was babysitting every night of the week because I wanted money to buy what I wanted to buy, right? And I forever am thankful to my mom because that was a piece of the entrepreneurial spirit as well, is that she said, yeah, you can, but you have to go get it. I'm not going to give it to you. There is, oh, I, I'm going to turn that mirror on to you. With you, my kids? No, no, no. There's, hold on. I was going to say, there's more to run. <laughs> hold on. The power of no. Right? Mom, can yes. I get this? No. Yeah. You go get it yourself. Yeah. Right? I uh, sure. Great. You want this? Go turn it. Do it yourself. Yes. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. As a parent, it's so difficult because they whine so bad and it's so good for them. Uh, so that's right. It's hard generally, generationally to not just give my kids things that my parents couldn't give me, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and now I can give those things to my kids. And so to not do it is difficult, but bringing that back to employees as well. Last, was it last week or right before Christmas? I said about three very key no's and my team is not used to hearing no's and <laughs> it sunk hard. Right. And it, but it was just three. I was, I, and it was more of a, you know what? I don't need to say yes to this. You know, there's there's no reason that I should have to do that out of obligation. So there were three hard no's. And which they one were quit. they? Let's go. Let's go. I, I I'm I'm curious. I want to know the details. Which do you remember what they were? I remember two of. Uh, wait, wait. What was the third? I remember two of them. Okay, one of them. This is so so minute. You're gonna be like Danielle. That's stupid. All right. Well, at our company, we all dress up professionally Monday through Thursday, and jeans are on Fridays. Mm -hmm. And so the week before Christmas, everybody's relaxed and it's holidays and people are like, hey, Danielle, can we wear jeans all week this week? I said, no, you can wear them when you're at home at Christmas. But when you come into the office, you're going to be still, I mean, no, because it affects attitude sometimes, right? I want people coming in prepared and ready and professional to serve our customers. And they were kind of taken aback, like, Danielle always lets us, you know, do stuff like this. We can have Halloween parties and costume parties and things. But Danielle said, no, Okay. But then they kept working just fine. And it was a big deal for me. That might sound so stupid, but I said no and I survived because I'm a yes man. <laughs> I, uh, hey, I completely agree. I, I yeah. just had a call, mm -hmm. a Zoom call. And this guy, he's, I don't know where he's in, in the Caribbean or something like that. He's a SaaS guy. And he's trying to sell me something with a t-shirt that his, his half buttoned, uh, his, I get, I love kids, love kids. Uh -huh. He's got a teenage girl behind him playing on TV on a device. I'm like, dude, like, yeah. I don't want to buy anything from you. You could have the best product in the world. Yeah. One, you're not introducing you. You're not saying, sir, I know it sounds ridiculous. Right. But I, even people who are younger than me, I treat with dignity and respect. And I say, yeah. good morning, sir. Good afternoon. And I'm 50 years old. Mm -hmm. So... Anyways, totally. I, I don't think that you're wrong at all. I think that yeah. the mindset of preparing yourself for the day is a good one.
What's the next one? I, I think it's important. The next one, this is a key employee, okay? This person has been with me for a couple of years, very, very loyal, very key employee, doing a great job, and I want this employee to have long-term employment with, with us, mm -hmm. right? I see a great career track. So it's very easy for me to say yes to this person because I want them here for a long time. Well, she recently got married, and we all knew that she was getting married. She invited all of us to the wedding, and she was so excited that she was getting married. And she let me know in her six-month review in July, when I get married in December, um, can the company pick up my husband's insurance? And I said, well, you know, I'll think about that. That was in July. So then she she comes and gets, a, you know, kind of corners me last two weeks, last week, did I say, or two weeks ago? She's like, hey, you know, I'm married now, and, you know, we talked about this six months ago, and I'd really like my husband's insurance to, to be 100% taken care of by the company. And I said, no. I said, I appreciate that you were able to ask, but uh, we'll look at a plan in the future that will be fair for, for all the employees that maybe when it comes to tenure or, you know, time here at the company or level, we can do family plans for everybody so that it's fair, but I can't do one-offs right now for anybody. So no. And she kind of took that as a stab, you know, because she'd been asking and mm. anticipating and inspecting because I always say yes. But the saying no, I believe that that kind of raises the bar of respect a little bit if done correctly so that they're like, okay, wait a minute. I can't just assume that I'm going to get every everything and I don't get to just be the poster child, right? That we do have to be fair for all the employees here. So, okay. How many How many people work with you? 18. Yeah. So if I said, cool. if I said yes to her, I mean, that could be really expensive doing that for everybody. I need a run ramp for that, right? Mm -hmm. A pathway mm -hmm. where we can make it work for people. So now I know that, Hey, you want this. Let me take a look at how we could do that for you and others in the future. <clears throat> you just reminded me of a, when I was working back in my mining days, a, a, a gentleman whose name was Ibrahim Injai. He had four wives. 23 kids. Mm -hmm. So that that's <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. So and barely made the I mean a, a salary in Africa he had four houses, all these kids and he was well, well respected. And so we're talking about employees and he says, "Martin, let me teach you something." He said, "Treat everybody special but everybody the same." Mm. And he says, "That's justice." I said, "Okay, explain to me." He said, Every time I'm with a, one of my wives, I say, here's a $5 because you're my favorite. Here's $5 because I love you, you're my favorite. But he does that with every single one of them. <sighs> so one time he said, you know, when all four wives were there and they're all bitching at each other and he said, they're all complaining and all that good stuff. And he says, stop. Who did I give $5 to because she's my favorite? And all four of them put their hands up. <laughs> And he says, you see, I love you all the same. And I was like, <laughs> I was like wow, that is powerful. <laughs> that is powerful. So to your point, your no was powerful, but very positive for others because yeah. now your leadership is even stronger yeah. because if anybody heard that, right? they go, oh, Danielle gave this to Susan, whatever. Well, then, Danielle, can I have some? Well, if you're saying no to me, why did you say yes to Susan? Right. It, it puts me in a bad position, right? It puts does. the company in a bad position, yeah. But but as a yes person, right, I like to please people. <laughs> I, I felt, I was like, ah! But, you know, I kind of had to think about it for a minute. I was like, no, this is the right thing for the company and for the team. And so now I'm so excited to develop a plan that people, people can be excited to work towards. I So mm -hmm. what are you, what is the... Now you got me going now. You got me thinking. What is the biggest no that you're afraid of for 2022? Let's think about that for a sec. What is your biggest fear of no? Like if somebody asks you something and you have to say no, what's what do you think is that biggest fear? Product development. <gasps> like innovation or R&D? Um, Maybe a little both, and maybe you can help me clarify. So we have an app or a technology company. We also mm -hmm. do a lot of coaching. But with our product, you know, never forget the ship that brought you there. But my fear is, hey, the landscape's changing all the time. And so it's so easy to look at bright, shiny objects out there. Hey, wait a minute. Maybe we need to morph into this a little bit. Maybe we need to partner with this technology. So we're constantly constantly looking at things, and the fear of, of loss is a very real thing. 
And so in 2022, focusing on the right pieces of technology and not doing too much is a fear. Like, uh, like letting go of the too much, right? Yeah. Saying, okay, that idea is a good idea and we should build that technology, but no, we're not going to do that this year. One of the suggestions that I give a lot of organization is to pick a budget. Hmm. He says, okay, here's your R&D budget. R&D is like you're developing new things, right? So if you've got a SaaS, this is a new product. Innovation is what do you currently have that you can improve on, right? So if you've got a SaaS, then what other features can you add to them that, that levels up that, that product? R&D is a completely new product. Right. So what I tend to offer companies is to say, okay, establish a budget can like at the casino budget, mm-hmm. you go, okay, I'm going to take a hundred bucks. I'm going to Vegas. I'm going to take a hundred bucks. If I lose that hundred bucks, ah, it's so what? so what? Totally. Yeah. And so that budget includes time, resources, and energy as well. So you go, okay, you guys can play in the sandbox all you want for, let's say, yes. An hour a week, no more. Yeah, good idea. And then having a solid NPD, NPI process, a new product development and new product introduction systemization is, okay, all these, how do you basically funnel all these great ideas into one so that you're developed at the frequency that you choose to do it, not that is imposed on you, but that you choose. Right. I want to have a new feature every six months. I want to have a new feature every 90 days. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you work your way backwards to say, okay, all these great ideas need to be kind of, and then there's a a close date. So this one goes into the next quarter because, you know, there's three that we have to identify and analyze. So you kind of systemize that because you can't, you can't box creativity. And to your point, if there's an opportunity that shows up, you need to bump that up. Right. Totally. Right. So my fear is, well, what if there's an opportunity that shows up and we say no to it because we're so focused on let's move these initiatives. But at the same time, I'm excited about being very laser focused this year. I'm excited about our team moving off this plateau. Like it's, it's really exciting and I want to protect that. I just want to be wise at the same time to make sure I don't say no to the wrong, you know, to the opportunities that should have been a yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think In my opinion, when you say no, you just, you're preparing yourself. So luck is where opportunity meets preparation, Mm -hmm. right? So you're prepared, you're prepared, and then this opportunity shows up. And so a lot of people say, oh, you're lucky. No, I'm just really well prepared. Totally. So I think that the the biggest thing is to create, uh, you know, I, I tell people a lot of time, well, how do you assess, how do you qualify your luck? But your biggest tool to be able to do that, I think you've nailed it, is to say no to everything else that deters you from picking that right opportunity, right? Yeah, it's the busyness. What's the what's the quickest no now you've got? Think about it. What in 2022, which one is gonna you're not gonna say, I'm gonna think about it, you're gonna go, somebody's gonna ask you something, you're gonna go, psh, no, psh, no, psh, no. <laughs> Man, it's hard not to think of employees. I feel like all the questions are going to come from employees, right? Can I have a raise? No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding on that one. <laughs> They're going to listen to this. They're going to be like, Damn. What? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't mean that one. Um, yeah. What's the quickest no? What's yours? The quickest no is an immediate answer. Oh, very smart. Very wise. So if they have to have an immediate answer. No, let me think about it. Mm -hmm. That's my quick, I've been, I, our core, our first core value is get shit done. Yes. And our superpower is often our kryptonite. So because we get shit done so fast, sometimes I tend to answer quickly, but in a position of leadership where I'm in the managing partner, my vision and direction does not impact work immediately. It, if they did not think about this beforehand, shame on them. Yeah. And if they need it implemented tomorrow, then I, too bad. I need to think about it. 
I need to delegate. Have you contacted your boss? Have you contacted your chain of command? Mm -hmm. Because that's what I do. I delegate and facilitate. Mm -hmm. So if it comes on my desk, I'm kind of like, I don't want to touch it. Yeah. You know what I'd love my quickest no to be this year? And since you asked, I would really like to create this into a habit for this year, for 2022. And the, the quick no of my job is approvals. Like when you bring something to me to look at, my job is to check mark and sign my initials and approve it, right? But if you bring me something that requires my thinking because you didn't do a good job and I have to tell you how to do it better, then no, I'm not going to look at it. Like do better and bring it back when you know you're going to get a check mark smiley face. And so no, no, I'm not going to look at it, right? I edited like a, I don't know, it was like an 11-page document uh, yesterday morning over breakfast and I was kind of frustrated with myself. Like it was a newer employee, so maybe they needed some direction. But I should have said, no, this is not ready for me to look at. So I'm not even going to touch it or waste my time until it's ready. There's your six shooter. <laughs> I got it. Highlighting. <laughs> Quickest no. What, what biggest no can somebody tell you that's going to get you – I, I, I want to say hot and bothered, but kind of mm, like, oh, you know what I'm already, saying? I already you, know. Are, you already know? It's my new software guy who's developing or managing my dev team. I come up with an idea and I say build it. And he's like, no, that's not a good idea. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so attitude, skill, knowledge, and experience, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so that so how are you going to deal with that? Or so you're currently dealing with that. So how are you going to improve that? Well, right, and it, it comes back to a management, right? Management things. I have to, um, I have to improve my communication. Um, given that I asked you to do this, and this is your responsibility to do it, when are you going to actually have it back to me? Right. And not accepting the pushback of, oh, I don't really like that. Okay. Did you need a little bit more understanding? And Martin, I, I have a lot of grace for people. I love people. I really do. So I have a lot of grace for the fact that people do think differently. Mm -hmm. the personality tests. I couldn't sit here and name them to you. I'm not great at it. I couldn't tell you your, or my mm -hmm. personality type. Right. But the fact that people process differently and people need to see and understand a vision roadmap differently. I can have some grace for that. And I understand as a leader, we way too often fall into the rut of assuming everybody can read our minds mm -hmm. and they can, <laughs> right? So it's not, it's not always their fault that we expect pie in the sky and they don't give it to us and we're mad about it. Like people are different. So I, I've really been trying to work on that with my communication and management in all the departments of, okay, you need me to lay this out to you strategy first. I can do that. I have found really three golden nuggets in my lifetime that I think if you surround yourself with people. So I have Kevin. He's my integrator. Kevin's my COO. And he knows exactly if somebody sends me an email and he's copied on it, he'll jump right in and he'll say, yep. <laughs> Hey, uh, so Kevin, uh, no, Kevin, uh, Dylan, you know, I'll take that. And Martin's, blah, 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 blah. so he's those, okay, okay, this is going to piss the boss off. Um, and then I have Andrea, who's a project manager, and Greta, who's my director of services in EA. And I will say something and they'll say, no, that's what Martin means. So I would strongly suggest that if you have an investment at your level to do is find somebody who is your translator. Mm. If, cause if you can find a second in command yeah, that really understand, and I don't like the word integrator. I like the word translator mm -hmm. because you and I agree. We, I mean, I get shit from my team all the time. They're like, Martin, can you please bring us back to reality? I was like, I am in reality. It's like 2032. <laughs> it's like, it's real there. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, 
And one of my, uh, one of my, oh, well, Dom said, you know, Martin, us as visionaries, we live so far in the future, we don't need back pockets on our pants. So, totally. <laughs> so my suggestion for you and, and yeah. all the listeners, if you're that visionary, you've got a whole bunch of people, get yourself a translator, get somebody who is that methodical kind of mm-hmm. needs data and analytics and takes your information and is not, in an, er, and, and says, okay, hold on. Here's what Danielle's really saying. Because I think that that's the key thing is for us, we're so fast, we think fast, we want to be there mm-hmm. forward. Mm-hmm. And you're like, look Why in my eyes. Why can't everybody get there and go faster? Well, totally. Read my mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so true. It's, it's like I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of Mowgli. What's that cartoon? Mowgli, uh, the snake and the, you know, the boy that oh, grew up yeah, in the jungle. Yeah, yeah. The right? jungle book, yeah. And then, yeah. The, yeah, the jungle book. And the snake's like singing the song, look into my eyes. <laughs> um. So yeah, so if so, if you're empowering, what's it? Is there another behavior? So what's the? Let me ask you this then. What is the enabling behavior? The top enabling behavior that you're doing that you're gonna you're gonna commit to not doing. This is this. like a coaching call. Oh, I'm sorry. I just. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry. You're, I'm like, so- you're like coaching me and holding me accountable on the air. <laughs> <laughs> people are going to listen to this and be like Danielle you promised you were going to change <laughs> I know um, so for for not enabling people and I'm going to hold people accountable better right based on met- metrics this is the metric that you had to hit and you didn't hit it so given that you didn't hit it like what are the repercussions of that so I'm going to do a better job managing by um, you know empowering my people with this is the metric you have to hit And we both agreed on that instead of letting them slide. Oh, well, it was COVID, right? How easy. Now, did did our business get to take a backseat because it was COVID? No. Did ownership get to take a backseat because it was COVID? No. But do our employees get to all the time use it as an excuse? Yeah. So holding everybody to a higher standard, um, you know, that's what I'm going to change is, no, this is your metric. You got to hit it. I I agree. And there. And, and for those who are listening, you guys, so the reason why I'm asking all these questions is because the feedback that we've gotten from the show is these, these, the, the problems that you're facing that we're asking one-on-one, the people who are listening going, shit, that's what I do. Shit, that's what I do. And so totally. they love to hear that this is, you know, this is what CEOs talk about. This is really mm-hmm. what CEOs talk about. Um, yes. I, I think that you're absolutely 100% because I, I, I tend to do the same thing. And like, oh, I told them that they could have the, the time off, but told them to need it to still work. So I'm not going to ask for it, even though I need it tomorrow, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. And I agree. Those those KPIs, we wouldn't ask our children to do anything else either. You want to raise them properly. So I, I, I'm not considering employees as 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 children. That's not, it's the behavior of leading that is similar to parenting. Yes, it is. That's a great way to say that. Mm -hmm. And there's a lack of leadership in, you know, this isn't a dig on anybody or a point on anybody. After high school, I went to a Bible school for four years out in Texas, and it was actually a leadership, kind of like a leadership academy. Mm -hmm. We took teenagers on mission trips all over the world. And so I spent four years there working. And we also did big, huge, like uh, dome events, right? Like 70, 80,000 attendee teenage oh, dome wow. events. So we, we hosted a lot of things. I was in charge of VIP fundraising and also marketing, not in charge of at that large mm-hmm. place, but a piece of, let's say that a piece of. And so I, it was a great experience work-wise. I loved being there during the time. But we had 11 classes a week. So we were interns in this program. We were working for the ministry. So we had full-time jobs. And then on the side, we had 11 classes a week. And the majority of those classes were leadership. And so, of course, the leader of leadership, even today, is John Maxwell. You know John Maxwell? I do not. He's got so many great books. Uh, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership is one in particular. Uh, how? Uh, and then another one, The Think It's Oh, yeah. One. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, I mean, yeah, you've I got do. to, yeah. right? Yeah, I yeah. do. I do. I do. I do. Sorry. How successful people think, right? Mm-hmm. And so John Maxwell was a, a big part of this leadership program that I was in as a teenager. And he was one of our, our keynotes all the time. He was constantly speaking to us. So anyway – Fast forward, Martin, I get out of that program four years later and I'm like, oh, I got leadership box checked. 
Boom. Mm. I just spent four years in leadership training. Well, I mean, by then I was 22 when I got out of that, right? So fast forward, I mean, now I'm 40. And oh, I I didn't need to do any leadership training because I did that back then, Mm -hmm. right? Well, last year I did a 10-week mastermind leadership training event I attended where we actually went back through again the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership through John Maxwell. And I sat there and I kicked myself and kicked myself and kicked myself every week because I'm like, good golly, for the last 10 years of running the new flat rate, why did I not put more importance on developing myself as a leader again, Mm -hmm. right? Because sure, I learned leadership a long time ago, but that wasn't even really applicable for today. Like things have changed and leading a team and a company to be able to be a great leader. Well, that's something that I feel has become so much of a lost art. And I tie that into, I took a big hit this past year, realizing and recognizing the lost opportunities I have because I mismanaged and misled some of my prior team members that aren't here today because of a, a lack of good leadership. Well, with my customer base, which are contractors all over the U.S. and Canada, you know, that's another thing that that we talk about and find, too, is that they were one-man operations. They were working in the truck. Mm -hmm. They were a service technician, and they're like, hey, I can do this. Then all of a sudden, they become a business owner, right? So they're the the Mm owner-operator, and then they get their first employee. And so they're working in it. I also view it kind of like an accountant or a doctor Mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, an attorney. It's like you can do things, but running the business is the side piece. And then you have to learn to run the business. It's separate from your niche or your skill, if you're still tracking with me, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so here we are in these skilled trades and we're so good at our skill and then we have to learn some business but leadership kind of gets put on the back 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 burner and now all of a sudden I'm saying you know we all need a wake-up call with leadership we need more leaders in business to really step up and to lead people and to teach the next generation no you don't get to show up when you want you got to be here when time starts right I mean without being a um, you know, constantly, what's the word? Nobody wants you to tell them what they're doing wrong all the time, yeah, right? There's, yeah. there's, a, there's a way to lead people and to motivate them. And it's not just your teams, but l- true leadership. I just feel that there's been a big lack in our society and it's time for all of us, especially as business owners, to take a look at it again and say, you know what? I bet I could go to the next level if I was if I was a better leader. The What a lot of people forget is that the, the, the path, the evolution again, from technician to manager to leader is that, you know, too many times founders and owners are the technician, then they go technician manager and they go, they think they can tell people what to do instead of leading people, right? So we, mm-hmm. we lead people, we manage systems. And, yeah. and too many times the, the only way, the only, and, and you're learning that path by delegating more is by creating that free time, you fill that free time with being a better leader. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. the less you're doing, the more your head is up. The more your head is up, the more you can see what's going on. I always compare leadership to a stagecoach driver back in the 1800s, right? You got eight beasts running as fast as they can. Yeah. You got people in the, in, in the stagecoach below, you got mail, you got money. Like, what's the safest way? Like, not too fast, not too bumpy. Like, you want to get fast enough so that you go through, you know, dangerous territories. But if one of your horse gets hurt, as a stagecoach driver, you would not jump in and run for that horse because you couldn't keep up with all the other horses. And where would the guidance come from? And where would the safety come from? So you have to run with seven horses instead of eight because you still need to sit in the driver's seat. I'm writing this down. Stagecoach leadership. That's yeah. really neat. It's pretty neat, huh? So, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's a big uh, concept. So I, we've been going down this path. I want to hear. So all of this leadership is going to be applied to your business. Tell us what does your business do, and what's going to be new, great, innovative in 2022. I want to. I, I, let, let's jazz this up. So you're going to be an amazing leader. You are an existing amazing leader. You're going to improve at being a better, even better leader. What do you do and how are you going to do it even better in 2022? 
I do something so awesome, Martin. I'm so glad you asked. And so thank you. <laughs> what I, I'm telling you, I do. I have a system that puts money in contractors' pockets and in the business pockets, right? And so we have a system, the new flat rate menu pricing system. It's an automated sales system because the technician operator type personality mm -hmm. does not want to be a salesperson. Mm -hmm. And so ours is a sales presentation tool that does the selling for them so that they don't have to do it, right? And that's what I love is that it's actually helping people by doing that communication piece and helping them to make more money because when given mm -hmm. choices, customers buy more. And we've proven 80% of the time, customers buy more than the bottom option that they've been given just when you give them choices. And so all of a sudden, we're increasing cash flow for small business owners all over the US and Canada. And that's what we want. Let's put more cash flow into your pockets in your company. I'll say company instead of pockets. Yeah. So that you can grow from a position of strength. Because mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you got money in the bank. Then you can get back up in that stagecoach driver seat for a minute and breathe and be like, okay, now what do we do? Well, now let's focus on your marketing. All right, let's make sure that the leads are coming in. Then let's go over here and take a look at your team. Do you have the right horses you know, on the right part of the line with your stagecoach leadership? So this is all important, right? And that's what we do. So we have the new flat rate, which is the actual menu pricing system, the product, the app. And then we have a, a group our high level coaching company that's called freedom builders university and with freedom builders this year in 2022 we're going to bring more people in we're opening it up to more people and they don't have to be new flat rate members that come in and we focus on 30 metrics and we're all about finding more freedom in your business we focus on your your impact and your legacy and what you really want in the future by how you're spending your time mm -hmm. and by getting the right money in right uh, and so with our product, I'm just excited. Currently, we serve heating and air, electrical, and plumbing contractors mm -hmm. and chimney. We're rolling out uh, beta for chimneys, uh, which is awesome. Includes like the masonry part of it. We have we launched this past year an indoor air quality app that has been awesome because, of course, people uh, really just started to talk more about it because of COVID, mm -hmm. indoor air quality, right? They've already mm -hmm. cared, but now homeowners are really starting to, mm -hmm. to care a little bit more. And there's a lot of contractors that don't, they're scared of it. They don't know how to get into indoor air quality. So we've had a great year with that. So moving into this next year, I'd like to continue to grow the verticals. Like how can we help even more people? So we're looking at pest control and garage oh. doors, right? And so we're really looking at, you know, how can we get into these other things, whether it's um, appliances, home repairs, to really help more companies to be able to grow from a position of strength by increasing their cash flow. And then um, the, a big initiative technology wise is doing more API integrations and partnerships with existing platforms to make it easier for our users. And so I feel like we're just in a great position where um, we can do these things that we used to couldn't do. And we're actually a younger tech company. We just you know turned tech in 2017. And today I'm very proud and excited on our platform and, and its capabilities and how it can really help people. So you should focus on snow removal. I feel there's really a, snow removal pricing is the range of it because people don't know it's a, it's Chuck in a truck, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm a landscaper and I, when it snows, I can't do anything. So I'm just going to plow and work my ass yeah. off. So they don't understand the pricing methodologies. I think yeah. that snow removal, there's some big, corporations in the eastern u.s that do really well but there's so many chucks in a truck with a bobcat mm -hmm. in the back yeah right they want to invest they say well okay so when the snow starts falling they'll put the plow on they'll put the salter on and then they carry their their um their bobcat or their quad to clean up the road but they they they're not they don't understand how to sell and so what's happening is a lot of uh well, i'll say snow removal general contractors are hiring all these younger or these mm -hmm. these ins, insulated or isolated truck drivers to be as contractors but i think that snow removal in regards to pricing methodology what you do would add a lot of value to their to that industry nobody's but, ever asked for that before so i uh want to take a look at it well That'd say no fun. say no yeah. say no first i mean you're right <laughs> no that's nice martin thanks for bringing that up no <laughs> But what I will do is pass that idea along and have somebody take a look at that uh, opportunity. <laughs> uh, Danielle, what is, so I said, Mr. Maxwell, I believe is, is so I asked this question, but I think it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be, it, it has been answered before. What's your go-to 
what's the thing that you always revert back to piece of reference material a movie a comment for me i'll give you an example for me the book is seven habits i mean i, I read that when i was young and first things first is I always prioritize every day that I open my calendar, I go, what's my priorities? What do I need to achieve first? Mm -hmm. And then the second one is the movie Master and Commander with mm -hmm. Russell Crowe, where yeah. he says men need to be led. And I know that's very generic related, but that was in the 1800s. But understanding the impact of every word and action that you have as a leader impacts the entire ship and, and the future and the livelihood of a lot of people. So those those are my two go-to. What what are your go-tos that you always refer back to in your day-to-day -day when it comes time to being a CEO or president? Yeah, you know, once a year I read How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Oh, yeah. Like so old school, right? All about you can have anything in life that you want as long as you help everybody else in life get what they want. And so focusing on what the needs of the people are and winning friends instead of me trying to sell, sell, sell. Martin, you need this, 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 this. What is it that you're interested in, right? Mm -hmm. Learning about people and caring about people, which is going back to the basics. But sometime over the, you know, it's like, how did we miss the basics of humanity? But we've gotten so techy and digital and Facebooky that, you know, we just miss it. Uh, so that that's really a big go-to to me is just the simplicity of going back to how to win friends and influence people and in, in the the good wisdom from Dale uh, Carnegie. I, I don't know how active you are on LinkedIn, but I get so many bot mm -hmm. emails and so, and then you, you answer and they didn't even know. And then my team was like, Hey, we can get a bot to fight the bot back and answer back <laughs> to you. And I was like, okay, so AI is talking to AI about what's best for each other's businesses. Is that hold on a second. Um, uh, That's awesome. <laughs> going there it's going there and then you know what movie wise um i really like moneyball <gasps> that is i i had forgotten about that movie that is really a good movie what do you yeah, like so much about it i'll tell you brad pitt's role is he's really trying to fix the problem they don't have money but they have to grow a team right and in business so many times we don't have the money but we got to get there and so you know, when my kids are in bed and my husband's asleep, I find myself turning that on sometimes because it just relates with my soul a little bit of, you know, just figuring things out. And then when it comes time to having to let people go, it's professional. Here's your paperwork. See you later. It's not personal, right? Uh, it's just, but it's, it's mainly his struggle. He's so passionate about building that team and he knows he can do it. And I feel that that relates with business. So it relates with my soul. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Danielle, for being on the show. This was wonderful. The conversation, we could have kept on going for another hour. We're really already at the hour mark. So uh, thank you very much. Was it? Did you enjoy it? Oh, I loved being here. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> and like I said, I mean, I wasn't really joking. You definitely coached me. I took notes. I got, I got notes. I feel held accountable. So it's been very, very productive time and, and fun. Fabulous. Thank you very much. With that being said, my name is Martin Hunter. I'm the host of What CEOs Talk About. And then do all the social stuff if you want to. Like, subscribe, and all that crap. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, folks. Thanks for tuning in to What CEOs Talk About. Make sure to click subscribe to get notified about future episodes or check us out at www.whatceostalkabout.com.